starting to go live. Are we going to go no, at the screen? You are live. There you go. <laughs> oh, wait. What are we doing here? Are we, like, disappearing? <laughs> are we disappearing? Oh, oh you're wait. live. Too late. I had Too a, late. Hello, you everyone. You should have prepped us. <laughs> oh my! Like, we're gonna go live, but everybody hide first. Don't worry about it. Nobody will know. And then we're live. And then... Pretend you don't see it. Yeah. Yeah. We're not actually live, everybody. It's it's. it's you it's, said it's, you'd do it, and then you didn't do it. You guys. Well, there's. We could have been joking. We didn't actually like sign an agreement. We're all about agreements, you know. What if there wasn't a contract? Oh, oh but I know what to do next time. All right, let me go ahead and share here and then we're ready to go. Oh, we have the link already? Yep, we are actually live right now. Wait. Okay. I'll share it to Infinite Playground. The standard pre-live move things around and make sure everything's clicked. <clears throat> See some people uh, saying hello, some people saying yay. I don't know hello, how to... Everybody. Find the direct link. I'll just do the page. You go to that. Yeah, I just went to you go to my page too. It's fine. Yeah. Jason, you've shared it. I can see it now. Yep. I am good here. Hey everyone. There's Missy. There's Mona. We have people joining in. There we go. Where's Dahlia? Julie. <laughs> Oops. Is that Rachel. my Discord? I thought I closed That's it. my Discord. Sorry. There's my mom. Good time. As always. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So are we still setting up or are we I'm in the ground running? I think we're only setting up, right? Like that's life. Yeah, true. That's true. <laughs> Am I the only one that can not hear Jason all that well? Forward. Wait, what'd you say? You, you can't what there, so well? I cannot hear Jason all that well. My speakers also sound kind of quiet, but he's the one I cannot hear the most. Jason, do you want a mic test? I'm trying to see if you Is can like, to... adjust people's volumes. I can mute people's audios, but not like raise it or lower it. Right. Jason, is there a way for you to get louder on your end? Not really. I mean, I, when I talk louder, I can do that as well, yeah. Unless there's... No, if it's maxed out. Well, so it should be listening to me pretty easily. As a for anyone that's watching, <laughs> technical difficulties are normal. It's, it's kind of like, you just a have part of life. anytime you go live these days. <laughs> Oh Lord! Hey, we even set up like ten minutes beforehand to make sure we got the technical difficulties yeah. out of the way. <laughs> Here we are. Well, I mean, the topic is authenticity, so well, it's <laughs> more authentic than showing people us setting up. Exactly. <laughs> Just hanging out. So Jen, you can hear the rest of us okay though, like me and Rithika. I can't hear anything suddenly. Oh uh, well. Hello, mic testing one two three. Jen, can you hear me? I guess. Oh, there's the ocean. <laughs> and the ocean's yeah. gone. Uh. Now we play the waiting game. I'm good at this game. So what's your favorite part about the video game so far? The character I chose getting to ride around on the, like my mount is a sword and it's pretty Ah, uh, you got the sword one. <laughs> exactly, yep. What about you? Oh, well, what class I guess you choose? Berserk. Berserker? Okay. Yeah. Yep. I'm Summoner. Yep. Nice. Yep. Makes sense. So far, just the awesomeness of the characters and like the way that mm -hmm. you can create them. I liked that you could actually move the face instead. Oh, yeah. Like, like click and to, drag like, on the, the face. Sidebar. Yeah. Yeah. So, exactly. A lot more customizability than normal. So that was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Agreed. Jen, can you hear us? And we can't hear no, we her. Can't hear she you. just talk. <laughs> she just changed something. I think she can hear us, but we can't hear her. It exactly. sounds like she's responding to us. Yep. Yeah, she just not in case. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. There it is. Oh, Skylar's asking, what game is this? This is a beta to Swords of Legends Online. It's the new MMO that's going to come out soon. Yep. Um, we have two weeks of beta and then the pre-release. And then after that, the actual game comes out. So I'm guessing probably in the end of June, early July. Probably. I've just noticed that the whole, OK, for me, I'm saying whole world, but I'm seeing Facebook. I'm seeing uh, WhatsApp. I'm seeing hotmail all of them releasing new agreements that are going to be live in june so june 1st june 15th june sometime there's yeah. a lot happening in june yeah a lot happening in june does that mean you're going to be releasing new agreements for rithika just in your world <laughs> we are as mtbo so yeah, right. yeah i mean makes sense for rithika yes he's specifically for rithika <laughs> Maybe we get creative and like Jen can mime a little bit. Testing, you. can you hear me? Uh, oh, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Oh, thank God. Us. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. <clears throat> All of us, clearly. Yeah. Well, probably not as Jason as much, but. <laughs> you can hear me, right? Barely. You sound like you're whispering. <laughs> oh, I heard you loud and clear there. Perfect. Yeah, right, so the, the, the connection is strong, but the the audio is not makes sense. Right. Makes sense. Cool. All right. So, are we ready to get the ball rolling? Rolling, rolling. Yeah, I am ready. Let's roll it out. So here we are for the second concept for MTVO class authenticity. Yay! <laughs> little fireworks. <laughs> so yeah, this this feels like a pretty awesome concept to talk about, especially because in MTVO, it's part of our mission statement, right? Mm -hmm. Like we dedicate ourselves to authenticity at all costs, among other things, like, like a life of sobriety also, but authenticity at all costs. And oh, there's always been some kind of questions around, well, first of all, what is authenticity and what does it mean to live with authenticity at all costs and to kind of make that choice to discover that for yourself, to discover yourself, and then move forward in that kind of dynamic. Yeah. So who wants to go first? What kind of experience? I'll, I'll start asking some questions. So in your journey so far in this lifetime, what's been one of the greatest lessons you've learned around being authentic? I'll answer. And for me, the, the hardest thing is the daily question that I ask myself. Everything that I have worked towards, everything that I have built, am I willing to give it up if it was authentic to do so? And then any part of me that's not willing to give up anything is what I work on and resolve so that I can move forward into my day. So a really good challenge for me as a litmus test is you did say that we are a sober organization. So if it were in front of me to do drugs, would I be willing to give up everything I've ever worked on to do that thing? And as long as the answer is yes, I don't have to really do drugs or anything because there's no point. But if, if it becomes something where something's more important than my authenticity, then that's where I get to work on something for me personally. So I find that authenticity at all costs literally means like anyone or anything in my world, am I willing to give it up if that's what it took to be authentic? And I always go back to that Bible verse with uh, Abraham and his son. And then like the, are you willing to sacrifice this person if this is what's been in front of you to do? Like how difficult that would be? I don't know. Like I, first of all, not a parent. Second of all, I not really ever killed anyone. So like you put all that together and it's like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. But if it was in front of me to do it, could I? Maybe. And that's really the authentic part for me is like, can I be what I need to be perfectly? without anything attaching to something else. And those things that are attaching to something else doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It just means it's something for me to work on and resolve so that I can be fully in this present moment. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, you're starting to talk about the the faith aspect of it very much so where there's your listening and you see the choices and then can you actually take that step fully with the faith that this is what I hear and this is where I'm at and this is what I'm going to do, period. Like no other extra fuss or ifs, ands, or maybes or doubts because there's no room for that if you're actually trying to or wanting to come from that space in general. Yeah, awesome. and you, you hit on another really good point because you said, you know, commit to a life of sobriety. And we don't commit to a life of sobriety. We commit to authenticity at all costs, but while being in the organization, we commit to sobriety mm -hmm. because it's important for people to know that like if you are like, let's say it is in front of you to do drugs and you're in the organization, then you leave the organization to go explore that route and then come back if you feel called to, right? So it's not a, like nothing is a permanence in, in life. Like nothing is more important than your authenticity, including the organization, including all of the practices, including everything in life. And that's what it means to be authentic at all costs. I want to be an example that looks like. And I think that that's something that gets a lot of people confused. They get into the organization, right? And then they, they hold on to it because they're like, I made it. Now I'll never let go. And it's like, that's the yeah. opposite of authenticity at all costs. Mm -hmm. Be willing to let go tomorrow, even though you got in today. So it's really cool to see that as we talk about authenticity, we break some of these stigmas that people have been holding on to for a really long time. Yeah. And then to go into kind of like the other, right, because what you started describing is like the outward from the inner to the outward perspective of how authenticity can show up. And one of the biggest lessons for me has been the opposite direction, where it's from like, from what's in front of me towards the inward like aspect of learning about authenticity so in what ways can i am i first of all honestly choosing to look at what's going on inside of me and around me can i see it as is and from there can i actually allow myself to go deeper into learning about me and going the extra step for me to you know, break whatever, like you were starting to mention, like the molds or the fixed ideas or any barriers that were kind of holding me back before. Like, because I know whatever decision I made or I can make, for example, there's always something greater for me there. And am I willing to actually look at that greatness that I can be and then explore that for myself? So yes, the the honesty of it all has been very, a big eye-opening experience for me. Like an honesty, right? Seeing the thing as is. Can you ask that question? Like... <laughs> you want to go first? Go ahead, Ritika. Okay. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, I'll go. I'll go. Um, it's funny that this happened actually because it's pretty connected to what I was feeling for myself around authenticity, and that is like communication has biggest been a big theme for me. Um, and it, and so hearing Jason share that it was very internal to external, and then Jesus say external to internal, I would actually describe mine as like. Um, almost bottom to top, but I guess where I'm coming from from there is really a lot of my challenges with authenticity have to do with my sense of security and what I've given my sense of security away to or my power away to, my value to. Um, so anything that I have seen as, you know, maybe I want something to value or someone to value me in a particular way, then I notice I tend to not show up as myself as much. I tend to trade my values in a certain way so that I show up a certain way. That's been my past experiences so far. And then, so uh, like one of the recent experiences I can think of as I say that is just going to massage school. Um, and for whatever reason, I felt some level of intimidation with my teacher there. Um, and so there was a lot of growing up I got to do throughout the months of going to massage school where um, you know, I claimed back my value from not just the students, but the teacher and, and the whole experience itself, where originally I felt really small and really tense and really tight, and I wouldn't speak up, I wouldn't share anything. And in that experience, I made a friend, actually, and I was kind of opening up to her about certain experiences I was having. Um, and she, sh she pointed out to me probably halfway through massage school, she was like, Jen, you're speaking up, like you're sharing, you're expressing. And I was like, yeah, I am. <laughs> I was really happy to hear that because it was true. I was starting to share my own values, my own truth with the massage teacher. Um, and, you know, of course, layer by layer by layer, I was starting to experience coming into my own sense of security, um, no matter who was around me. Of course, that continues to be my journey today. But for me, it really comes down to the courage around my communication 
how I'm choosing to see myself. Because I think that I went into massage school having a kind of a small sense of self or an insecure sense of self as far as my ability to learn. And then I kept proving to myself in a lot of ways, okay, I can learn. I just have to come up with my own methods that I didn't find out until after college um, and, of course, after high school. So, yeah, that, that would be my, my understanding of authenticity as it's applied to my world. But, yeah. Awesome. I'm glad you spoke first, Jen, because I connect with <laughs> the experience that you just shared. Nice. Uh, for me, it was like when you asked that question, Jesus, what came up was, uh, I think it was around 2016, 2017, when for the first time, um, Jason, you put out the post for Egypt. And I, I was like feeling called to do this. And I don't know what got into me. One day I recorded this video and out, out into the world, I made a post saying, I am committing 100% to my divinity and I'm choosing to do this for 5D and all of that. And before that in my world, I, it was like just a few people who I would speak to like that. And after making that video and making that commitment to myself, like layer after layer and like as time passed, I sent a message to my entire family. And it was almost like me coming out. But when I did that, it, it almost like it was so big in my mind but my family was like sending me hearts and like love and like some of them didn't even notice and didn't even care or like it was not a big deal at all. And I had made it like this big mountain as if I'm like the black sheep of my family. And, you know, just past experiences had really like grown around me and to feel so big. And that was like, like a sigh of relief. And from then on, I felt like it was, it was easier. And that experience still is like a, is like a, like a landmark or a benchmark that I can do that. And, and I'm still in that process because there are a lot of places where people see me a certain way and we've connected in a certain way. So when I go back, like Jen said, I am often feeling torn between like, oh, but this is who I am today. They don't know what I've go gone through. And if I show up in another way, how will they connect with me? And I might lose them. And that comes up very often. This is specifically around the theme of friends and family. And again, like last night, I had a call with a friend who's a really old friend. And I just sh like chose to show up in as myself, share whatever wisdom I felt called to share, speak, instead of like getting in my own head. And at the end of the call, it was like, wow, like, this is my world and I can connect with this friend even on topics like that. That's amazing. So I'm just surprising myself as I'm allowing myself. And that's been my journey into authenticity. Yeah. That's well said. Yeah. I think that so many times we're conditioned to believe that we are the minority in the way that we believe. And mm -hmm. the thing is like, if you truly have a connection with somebody, your connection is there. So whatever you share, if it's a true connection is only going to enhance that connection as long as you're being honest. Like that's the truth of it. If it's a fake connection, then yeah, you're gonna disrupt it. It's gonna get shaken up a little bit, but then truth is gonna be in that connection or that connection will end and a new connection that is more authentic and more real will appear. So at the very worst case scenario, you lose a friend and gain a lifelong friend. And I, I don't really think that that's that bad. When, when I think about it, I, I would prefer to have people that I can be myself with 100% open and honest and just have fun with that. Even if it's weird and silly and strange and it's my own flavor of Jason, that, that doesn't matter, right? Because your friends are your friends. They're, they're real. And then in this world, we're taught that we need many friends. I remember when I was a little kid, my mom was like, if you can just make one real friend, just one real friend, it'll be better than most. Because most people only have fake friends these days. So that was my mission. I want to make one real friend. And I did. And they were amazing friends because of that. And then I made more real friends because of that. And then other people made real friends. But prior to that, people were just making friends based on other concepts. So examples need to be in all things. And when you're authentic, you'll find that your world represents that. And I love that, that you're able to have that deeper connection where that fear once was. And it's fun that you guys did fear last time, right? Like that was last week and this week's authenticity because fear is the one thing that stands in the way of authenticity. This belief that, hey, 
if I'm me, then the world is going to crucify me, or I'm going to be burned at the stake, or I'm going to lose everything I've ever worked towards, because that's what we're taught. That's what we're conditioned to believe. But it's not true. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're talking about like what you both are now talking about, well, technically all of us, is the connection between, right, the value points, what you, what you learned about valuing from like way back in the day, and then you taking your power back and being able to value things how you want to value them, and then make steps or connections or whatever you want to do from that. Right. So, yeah, when we grew up, especially in the time that we grew up in, right, there was a lot of emphasis trying to go into kind of marketing and then social structures and social dynamics to tell you it's like, okay, there is a normal, there is a standard, and this is kind of how you start to approach these. And then by the time you get to this point, you'll be happy. And what they don't tell you is that point always keeps growing and growing and growing. And you never actually reach that point because they keep throwing things on as you grow up that's like, okay, now value this and you'll make more room to have be happier and then value this thing and so on and so forth and it all compounds to where suddenly all of your value is just spent on the first thing like the from the moment you wake up your value has already been spent on all these things that you had purchased or done or try to perceive or try to work through your life and then you get to work and then suddenly you're just grudging along because you were just dragged the whole way told that you're making this choice for you because this is what you want in the end emphasis on this is someone telling you that this is what you want and that's everything we're talking about it's like you're calling your power back and then taking deciding it's like okay i now get to make at least one choice for myself well how can i even start to make one choice for myself it might even be you know what i'm going to buy my own new brand of toothpaste and taste it like test it out taste it out also and see how that starts to develop and from there you start to grow individually yep you will never know who you are until you make your own decisions and then I'll, I'll actually go one step further, actually. So from then, if you start to play, like once you start to realize the value game that was playing out, you go into the second factor, which is what Jason was talking about, which you could call like the second postulate idea, where you start to realize, okay, now I know that I'm going to make a choice. So it's like, yeah, I want to buy this new toothpaste, but then you start to like a parts of you start to add in little the second posture like the, the ideas are like i'm going to buy this to toothpaste but i'm only going to try it for a while and then if i don't like it i'll go back to the other one so you start to have mm -hmm. your listening but it's starting to like get crowded and compacted into something where you immediately start to doubt it or put less of you in there so you devalue your own choice so it's like you start to value mm -hmm. it and then you automatically like you turn a blind eye and you start to take your own value out and then you slowly creep back into right, the old habits. And that's fine. At least you're starting to make room for yourself. But always notice that if like you feel I want to do this, period, right, the practice might be to just leave it at that and don't let any other kind of idea or voice or a lot of those things might come in as a voice. Some of those might just come in as patterns. A lot of it might be neural pathways or emotional, but it is a huge balance game of like, in what ways am I giving, receiving, playing, not playing, just being a subordinate and so on and so forth. There was this one time when I was just starting on my career and he's just the thing that you mentioned about like these choices being made for us. There was a family friend and I was uh, recommended to do CA, which is the equivalent for CPA for you guys in America. And uh, I chose to do it and I went onto the path and I couldn't clear it. It's supposed to be a really tough exam, even in India. And I like locked myself for months and I wanted to really, really do this because the way it had been, you know, shared with me, I had made it this big thing. Like, this is a thing of glory. It brings like, if there's nobody in my family who's cleared CPA before and it's going to be amazing and I'll have this career, this job, the money. And at the end of it, when I couldn't clear it, I felt depressed. I felt like the biggest failure of my life. I wanted to really blame the man who recommended it to me and also felt like I couldn't face my own family and my father because he kind of in his, like in my best interest said, you're born to do great things and you can never fail. And you know, growing up like that, the first big failure. And then I realized that as I actually made the choice of, after going through that depression to, to actually choose what I want to do. And that's when I founded my own like organization and the, for the very first time, that was like one of the best and the most amazing decisions I've made in my entire life. 
And as I went into that journey and made that choice and followed through, I had to handle my accounts in my own organization. And I also came to the realization that it wasn't a waste that I went through this journey of doing the, the CPA course and all of that, because now I could understand all of these things. And also in my own path and through my own choices and coming into my own power, I was able to claim my power back from this person, not like have him as like this victimizer who had something bad in his mind while making this you know, recommendation to me. And I was able to like finally move and see like the greater game. So for me, I feel like the journey has really been to, like you said, to make that choice and to follow through. And as I made the choice that made me happy, the lessons and the realizations and the need to make anybody else an enemy automatically started to dissipate. Because at the end of the day, I did, at whatever age, I gave my power away. And there are these constructs, but I gave my power away. When It depends whenever we realize that, but it's the constructs are also for us you know in a certain sense if that makes sense yeah you're starting then what you're like going into now is it when you start to make some of those decisions like how we were taught back in the day right some of us where you make a choice you think you're making your own choice but you're not two of the in my experience two of the biggest emotions that could come up are disappointment and resentment right to me they go hand in hand where you like okay this you gave your power away to this person and you did not look at this piece inside of you when you were making the choice and they make the choice for you and you did not voice anything so suddenly you're carrying around this kind of like extra bag of emotions and weight where you're quite like you could be beating yourself up you could be wanting to beat them up or just whatever because because you did not choose to show up in that space. And then that again, right, if you start to reflect it inside of you is the self disappointment, where you're like, wow, I did not, like, I just keep seeing this repeated pattern of I did not choose to do this. Mm -hmm. Every single time this person shows up in my life, I always tend to feel this way from the second they walk into the room and so on and so forth, because the power has just been given away. And you do not mid like at that point right a part of you doesn't want to look at your own side of in what way can i actually make a change to turn this around for me in my favor to at least feel some sort of life for myself yeah that's true that is true i felt miserable working for this person for like one one and a half year and i wouldn't know why and i kept thinking they just want my life to be held mm -hmm. <laughs> yep I get that a lot. A lot of dudes <laughs> constantly think that I want their life to be hell. So I, I totally understand. I've been on the other side of that one quite quite a many times. Whenever you hold any space of authority in anyone's life, it's kind of like par for the course, so to speak, that at some point they are going to turn on you. And you just hope that when they turn on you, that they catch themselves in the middle of it. But most of the time, it doesn't happen that way. It takes years before the person comes back around and they're like, oh crap, it's actually me who didn't take responsibility. All I have to do is work on this thing and then I don't have to hate this person anymore. It's like, yeah, it's that simple. Could have been done two years ago, super easy. But you know, it is what it is and people take the time that they take. So that's the journey though. And it's on both sides for a reason. That person could have done better at explaining the, the way to you, right? And you could have done better at receiving the way. So both people have their own experience to play with. It's not that one or the other is right or wrong. It's just they're different sides of the same equation, which is the resentment game. And the thing is, anytime you're not being authentic, what do you get? Resentment. Guaranteed. Mm -hmm. You either resent someone else or you resent yourself. But there's always resentment because that's how you balance the equation. Yeah, I feel like sharing some of my, some of what's like coming to the surface and pretty much healing as you guys are sharing what you're sharing. So I'm, I'm remembering going back into high school times when um, both of my sisters were in the drill team right as I was coming into high school as a freshman. And we, we all lived in like a smaller home at that time. And um, because of that, we were so highly aware of what we had in common and we didn't like it um so like i had an older sister that was in the choir and i wanted to be in the choir and i had both my sisters in the dance team and i wanted to be in the dance team so there was this conflict that would start to build between us where 
um, we would fight each other because of this. And, and then I would feel on some level the, tr the idea that they were telling me, which was I was trying to be like them. And that I, and I, I'm seeing as you guys are sharing what you're sharing, how um, as time has gone on, because because I started to kind of make myself small so that my sisters could have their life paths, could have their dreams, um, that that's been kind of like a pattern throughout my life going on is where here, I'll move to the side so you can do what you need to do and what you want to do. And so anyway, hearing you guys talk, I'm like, I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> I don't have to move myself to the side so that everybody else can have their dreams and I, honestly i'm i'm very much living in my dream i feel like oh my gosh there's so much that i've gotten to create for myself that it, i'm blown away so the fact that there's more like there's more work that i can do is even is awesome because there's more dream to have yeah you hit on a really good point there's this belief in the world today and i don't know where it came from or why it came there but it's this belief that for me to grow you have to lessen or for mm -hmm. me to step forward, you have to step back. It's almost like instead of the person who is actually holding the responsibility for the container and authority and being in their awesomeness, instead of acknowledging that and celebrating that and being grateful for that and then moving into your own, it's just easier for people to tear this down so that they don't have to look at it anymore. Mm -hmm. And I don't really understand the whole reason behind it, but I've seen it a lot in my life, a whole lot. People will constantly be like, you're too big for the room. There's no room for anyone else. And it's like, then grow up. <laughs> There's infinite space. And for some reason, people don't see that. So I think that's another part of the interesting dynamic is like what you're talking about, because the only reason we would ever need to shrink or move or be smaller is because there isn't infinite space, which tells me that there's this belief on like, maybe it's unconscious, maybe it's inherent. I don't know, but there's a scarcity to existence somewhere mm. you know like you're infinite so there's got to be infinite space like mm -hmm. so, so why do we think we're copies yeah. of each other yeah that takes me to the like the straight to the idea of like going if you go to the essence of the competitive nature where there's only competition if you try if a part of you feels like that person has something that you I want in your life or you feel like you have to prove yourself in some way like you have there that thing that is for you is outside of you right so in mm -hmm. some way you have to reach out forcefully right out of your own source to make this thing happen for yourself and yes like that goes back to what we were talking about before the fear aspects or, or like the lack or misunderstanding of the situation to make you feel like that person is actually against me instead of with me right because everything we're talking about like authenticity love and actual growth and i, I mean more cl like closer to capital g growth actually builds everything together as a community instead of yep. pieces at a time while letting others fade away and die everything gets to grow together the blanket approach to life. Mm -hmm. All right, I have a question for, for everyone here. So I've been working on authenticity my whole life and I believe that everyone here has as well. It's been a premise behind like kind of why we came to earth in the first place. Have you ever seen where you being authentic in any way, shape or form weakened the people around you? Because I haven't. Every time I've ever been authentic, I've watched the world around me become better and stronger because of it. And I'm just curious if anyone here has seen the opposite. Every time I've like worked with authenticity and made my authentic choices, I've like the first thing I see is it gives choice in so many other areas to other people. And they might feel whatever they feel in response, right? If, if you look at it in a very small scope to them, it might feel like now I just feel angry at you, for example, but in truth, you just mm -hmm. gave them choice to actually see there's another potential in this area in their life. So no, I, to me, it's just, it just makes things better. I agree. And I also feel like, just as you mentioned, there are sometimes moments when it appears like oh my god this went the wrong side or the wrong way but it when i look at it from the zoomed out perspective i can see that in the long run it was perfect because in that moment it's it's like the hurt or the anger that jesus you just mentioned that it might seem like okay now i have this room for myself i'm literally like sitting in a room and we've shared like a space in my house for ages but the fact that I'm able to take this and not feel guilty, because I would feel guilty having my own space. 
in the short run, it can, you know, like trigger people in my family, like, oh, she's got a room to herself. Not, not all my siblings have a room to themselves. And, but in the long run, I'm already like sensing that there is, there has been this conversation in my house around like everyone having space, maybe as moving into a bigger house and things like that. So in the short run, it can trigger and bring up those hurts and feel like, oh my God, me being authentic really caused trouble. But I know in my heart and I know when I've zoomed out and really been like present and seen the situation for what it is, it has always felt like that was expansive. Yeah. I would almost say the exact same thing as what Rithika just shared. Um, and what all of that has brought up is the, like one of my probably common holding patterns for myself around authenticity, where I'll probably like, if I'm expanding into authenticity, I'll stop somewhere, is is where I start to see that I'm upsetting people, I'm triggering people, or they're upset at me in particular. Um, and that's where I feel like I'll stop, maybe shrink back or or try to like go inward and see, okay, what can I do? But a lot of times I'll I'll stop myself and, and start to take it personally, obviously. Um, but a lot of times just through, you know, experience and just all the adventures I've had through life, I'll I'll learn over time and I have been learning over time to just keep keep going. Like those triggers that people are going through are there, you know, Jason brought up. Do, what did you say? Losing strength? They're gaining strength. They're gaining choice. They are gaining opportunity. Um, so I feel like a lot of it is just reframing my perspective of what is going on in the space and with others. Yeah, like I'll, I'll share kind of like to keep going with the concept you guys are talking about. I've been taking singing lessons for a little over a year now. And it took me a while to realize, first of all, I love the lessons, like working on my voice has been some of the greatest highlights I've ever received in my life because it's actually helping me open up in my own way of just looking at myself and allowing myself to exist, my own frequency to actually exist. But the biggest lesson I started to learn was when I showed up to those singing lessons, right, because the potential of it helping me was a, like affecting me from even the day before the lesson, right? Not even when I actually got to the lesson and the highlights actually happened, but the day before, like the sleep cycle before where I knew the next day I was going to wake up and, you know, get to prep for the class, whether I was like warm up with some scales or something. But even before then, I was my mind and my body, whatever was going to be highlighted was already going through whatever you know, needed to exist for me, whatever like frequency highlight anything. So from that point, I was already given the option to look at, okay, there's something uneasy happening inside of me. It is not a bad thing. It could be perceived as a bad thing because I could start to sweat. I could start to like tense up my muscles. And that could be me perceiving like this, my singing teacher as like, oh, they don't know what they're doing. Some, for some reason, they're just poking on me at purpose and telling me like, hey, keep working on this. It's not right. I could have heard it like, Hey Zeus, you just don't know how to sing. Why are you still here? But in reality, my teacher was just saying, it's like, hey, you know, just like this, you asked for this and it's okay. The, everybody has to start somewhere. And what my teacher was actually so like celebrating me a lot more often than I actually heard because I was closing off my own ears to what was actually in the space because of my own fears and projections that I was putting on myself that then obviously reflected into my world and then my teacher. So I've learned so much. Mm -hmm. Action's a fun one. What, what did you say is fun, Jason? I said projection is a fun projection. one. Yeah, yeah, you're either always on one side of it or the other whenever it exists. And it's always fascinating to kind of just see how it works. What do you mean by one side or the other? So if you are the light, you're always the one that is projected on. And if you have an insecurity, you're always the one that's projecting. Mm -hmm. it's always that way so like anytime that somebody says something about you you can either feel it take it personal and then you know that you're the one that's like it taking itself self-conscious and personal and then you're going to project on others right mm -hmm. or you can take that same feedback and look at it and understand it from where it's really coming from and that's a beautiful thing because anything that's said to you there's a truth to it right it doesn't necessarily mean you this version of you is the version that they're seeing but they're seeing a version of something somewhere that reminds them of something in them. And so you can actually handle that by being the light, by being authentic in that space and being like, okay, cool. Thank you for expressing that. And then you can have a dialogue or discussion if that person is a reasonable person. If they're not a reasonable person, then that's really just your own inner work that you get to work on. 
But if they mm -hmm. are a reasonable person, like they actually are capable of having their own coherent thoughts, then yeah, you can actually have conversations with them and then the projection dissolves and dissipates and then you never have to have it go through that again. It's a really powerful opportunity. But for most people, they're unreasonable when they use projection. Right. That brings up defensiveness. Mm -hmm. Like that's what I see as, as the most common response when someone is, well, I guess that's the more unreasonable people, but, or if they have un, the inability to reason in that moment. So not necessarily they are unreasonable, but, um, but that's a common effect of authenticity to work through. It's just yeah. defensiveness. Definitely I don't want to look. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, that, that defensiveness, like what to go back to what Jason was touching on, like it goes both ways, just like with the projection. It's like you're either defending against what you're looking at or holding strong your own walls. So you feel like what you're doing is the right thing. And you're just like starting to put flagpoles and starting to mark your territory where it's actually fighting instead of showing up as the light. A yeah. battle. Righteousness versus being mm -hmm. in the right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to find that grain of truth for yourself in that moment because it, it could be just this fun, you could think it is this, but it's actually something else. So you're sure of your approach and you're doing it for all the right reasons and you think you're coming from your divinity. But if it is coming, like you know, you mentioned Jason, there is a there's a small part, and that's been this tonight has been that process for me. I was absolutely not expecting that. It was a tiny little expression. And I was bawling my eyes out. And when I discovered what it was about my personality that was triggering me so much, I was just amazed and then just feeling grateful and like then elated. But it's and literally that, that ability and that possibility to find that uh, grain of truth in what is being projected and then being able to do that work is just so fulfilling, I would say. Yeah, so mm -hmm. whichever side you're, you're on, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I'll share one more quality that I love feeling about, you know, experiencing an authentic choice that I've made is if I continue that every choice and every step forward feels that much more momentum bringing. I feel that much more mm -hmm. life, that much more lightness, that much more happiness, joy and existence with every single step I take in that. And if I ever feel like I take a step in an authentic way and I don't choose to see like the how the resentment it could have caused inside of me or whatever kind of density I could have moved with, I do stand up feeling more tired or I kind of just want to slouch or attend like it shows up physically. It might show up physically in my body. But to me, when I've always made the authentic choice, it just keeps wanting to go and go and go. And I feel better each time. Yeah. In moments later, Jesus says, you're describing something and I'm just feeling it's happening again. It happened on the first live also. As soon as I made this choice and like healed this and found like this grin, the next moment I get messaged by somebody and they're going through something similar and they're projecting on someone and I choose to do nothing, observe and just say that, hey, I just went through this process right now. I don't know why. And I did feel like sharing that with them. I just said like, hey, personality influx today. I just went through a crazy <laughs> thing. And moments later, they just, they, they had their own realization around things. Mm. And so I'm just seeing like I did something and then my reality and that momentum you're speaking about, it was like in my face to celebrate and like look at, you know, it was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Nice. How has so it do, been on the live? How has the personality influx been for authenticity? Like in context to that for you guys? I would say that it's been amazingly painful and beautiful in the same way. <laughs> There's so many awesome moments of reflection that can happen when the world that you've built gets hit with everything that it can possibly mm -hmm. get hit with all in the same week. Because leading up to the personality structure and flux, like everything happened, you know, we lost one of the people at Void Space, our Void, yeah, Void Space Technologies, you know, they died and that made things really difficult. And then that person had to go through a lot of things because their fiance went through some things and it's just a whole thing. And so then there was like trying to take care of that part of it. And then the crypto thing happened and then there was the taking care of that part of it. 
and then the ZV tax stuff happened, there was taking care of that part of it. And then the tour stuff happened, there's taking care of that part of it. And I was just like, okay, and this is why you don't run this many companies. Learning mm. some really good lessons here. One major influx comes in, the holy mm. grail of all influxes, the one that knocks it all down to the ground. And you have so many different angles to observe and learn from because each company is like a kid and each kid goes through its own temper tantrums. And so you get to watch all of these temper tantrums and to learn to be stable in that and be like, okay, well, if I wake up tomorrow and nothing that I've built exists, is that okay? And I got to a place where I was like, yeah, that's okay. And then it was like, okay, well now what can I do to assist these things so that they can stay around if it's authentic? And so it was, it was difficult though. I will say this was probably the hardest week of my life because mm. all of the things that could go wrong pretty much did. And I'm grateful for it because I got challenged on so many levels. And now that I'm on the other side of it, I'm like, wow, that was actually pretty incredible. I feel really good about what I was able to handle and the parts of me that weren't able to handle things. I can forgive those parts of me because those parts of me were the weaker parts of me and they grew up into stronger parts of me because of the experience. But it wasn't easy to go through it. It was fun to go through it. It was like playing a level of difficulty in a video game that doesn't exist because it's so hard that no one would ever play the game. But at the same time, it's over now. And I'm just kind of like, wow, the amount of experience that I got for this, my character leveled up on so many levels. It was incredible, every angle possible. And I was able to handle most of it. So mm -hmm. I would say that the personality structure influx and just the restoration phase and all the things that we're going through in general has been a really amazing look at all the places that I was wrong and a really amazing look at all the places that I was right. Mm -hmm. And an ability to really reconcile both of those and accept that I am just me and that it's okay that I got some things wrong and that it's okay that I got some things right. And it doesn't make me any less than or any more than. And that freedom to just be in that state has been the journey for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it, it has been a whole process of the universe just being like, oh, you're about to take a step and pull the carpet like right on from under you, like every yeah. single step. Like you think you you think you then cut your balance and your universe is like, nope, no, you have not. Keep dancing around and you're, you fall on your face like seven times. And yeah, Jason, you and I have had some pretty deep conversations about like the past few days and just what's been going on. Uh, but yep. the big, like one of the other big sides that I'm learning and just continuing to grow about like from what's being highlighted these past few days is, the 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 way support can show up also right it's like i could reach out to anyone here like in this call and like we could help each other out and just talk through things but i'm also i also know and also because of the nature of like the authenticity that we're talking about that the support can exist in any way whatsoever in my world in my reality like i could like there could be a point where i could reach out to rithika and ask her questions like could you just help me look at this real quick and cool we might have a little chat and then i know that here in my home it could be that i end up watching a tv show and it might have the perfect message for me to get or or I might actually just look at my phone in the middle like of the of the universe just having pulled the carpet i happen to look at my phone and i get this awesome message from my mom or my brother and it's like the support is always also there it's just am i also willing to show up for it and let it exist in my world exactly yeah i would um describe my personality influx as definitely having scary moments um nothing like what jason was sharing with like all of the companies he's juggling and everything he described there. But mine has been more like an exploration of what it feels like to be in the world. Um, because I would say prior to the personality influx or prior to May, I was doing a lot of going inward and doing my own thing in the house that I live in, um, playing with the dogs. But yeah, so personality influx has been a lot of experimenting with communicating with people that are I don't normally communicate with and then finding my personality very triggered at being misunderstood probably repeatedly over and over and over and over again. And I've definitely gotten to work on being okay with being <laughs> misunderstood. I haven't mastered that yet. I haven't completed that game, but um, but it's happening over and over again. It's it's happened today a few times too. So so we'll see we'll see what happens from all of it. But I feel I feel pretty good about you know where it's all taking me. Especially, you know, I would say that going into my first live, or it felt like my first live just this week, just a few days ago, that was one of the very, very scary personality 
um, tests I went through. And in the end, I felt very glowy and happy. So that was a good one. But that was, those are my experiences recently. Awesome. Rithika, do you feel like asking the questions that we have set up for the MTVO class, the five questions, and then see if we feel called to answer any of them? Okay. So one by one, Jen? <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> okay, so the five questions this week are, what does authenticity mean to me? I think we answered that together in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Where do I show up authentically in my life? Does anyone feel called to? I'm expecting everyone on this call would say everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like my goal. I'm not going to say it, it's true, but my goal is to show up authentically everywhere. And where I'm not mm -hmm. authentic, my goal is to grow into authenticity in those areas. So I really want my whole life to be an authentic example of what I am capable of so that I can grow into that. But it's not always that case, right? Like there's always going to be little parts of you that were triggered when you were a child that you don't even know you had until the moment presents itself. Yep. Yeah, like there could be one moment where you're, you've totally like mastered with showing up authentically in this area, but because there's like different kinds of influxes or you happen to have made more room, you take that step and suddenly you feel a very different vibration in your heart or in your stomach or your hips or your knees start to shake or something. And there's something new for you to look at right then and there. Back in the day with video games, a long, long time ago, they, they used to troll people and they would actually like have in the noob zone, like a, a high level monster would just appear. And if, if the team could rally together to kill it, it would give like amazing loot. And it was one of my favorite things because you're just like, have your character, you're kind of like on autopilot, it's like four in the morning and you're like, eyes are closed, but you're just trying to click through and kill all the rats necessary to get the tails, to make some money so that you can buy that sword from the bazaar. Anyway. Long story short, and then like this white mouse appears and you're like, what? And then it just slaughters you and you're like, okay, what just happened? <laughs> and, and that's kind of like life. You, you're in the noob zone because you, you've gotten your expectations. You know exactly what you're, you're looking forward to. It all makes sense. And then the influx comes in and it's this little tiny white rabbit and it's just jumping around and you're like, oh, how cute. And then you're dead. <laughs> and it's one of those moments where that's how it felt, you know? Like hmm. authenticity feels like that. Like you are like, yeah, I've got it. I'm, I'm gamed on. I'm like, I've got everything ready. I've done this zone a thousand times. And then there's this little tiny white rabbit and you just get owned. But if you rally together, if you actually work through it, it's, it's hmm. amazing because you can learn from that white rabbit and it challenges you on levels that you've never been challenged before. Sure. But yeah, I miss that about video games. I don't do it anymore because people are hmm. too triggered these days, but <laughs> if, you, if you would actually like back in the day when people didn't care about being triggered and they actually looked forward to it, mm -hmm. those were those were some great video games that came out back then. That yeah, was a time like, in the world. Yeah, yeah like back uh, then, when the most first started. Ultima mm -hmm. Online did it a lot. Uh, EverQuest did it. There were a lot of really great games that that did it back in the day. I don't know about World of Warcraft because I never played it in vanilla. So, but I, yeah. I assume they probably did it as well. It was just yeah, more exactly. like a little fun community thing. And then a lot of like, even like the games on console before then a lot of them didn't have save until like later in life. So yeah. you would have to restart the game from the beginning after like seven hours of playing. Like games were a different kind of brutal back then where it's like, you just had a, like you had a joy for the game and that's all that mattered. That's it. Now we have so many safety nets. And I think that's what's leading into so much entitlement is, is people expecting those safety nets, both in video games and life. And in life, yeah. I had so yep. many people in this last week reach out to me and say, you should have told me this. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, why? Why should I have told you this? In no world could I have imagined this thing. So why mm -hmm. would I have told you this thing and created it? Does it make sense? Like you, you need to take responsibility for the fact that you chose this thing too. Like mm -hmm. we all chose this together. So now we get to learn together to what it means. But so many people feel that entitlement. Like, for instance, in that case, like you're you're playing and you're the little character and you're you're killing the little rats and getting the tails and stuff, and then the white bunny shows up. You you if you were these days, you'd be like the the person you messaging a GM and be like, you should have told me that you were going to be having this event that's completely random. <laughs> like, what you know? And I think that in a lot of ways, I've seen this as well with God. Like a lot of people are like, God, why didn't you tell me that this was going to happen? It's like because then it wouldn't have happened. 
He would have avoided it. <laughs> like, if I told you that you were going to get a car wreck if you went straight on that road, what would you have done? You would have turned, but then you wouldn't have met this person in this car who just changed your life. You don't know the beauty of the gift unless you show up fully for it. If you even miss a moment of the gift, you're missing out on a huge opportunity because nothing happens by chance and nothing is random. Everything is part of a very elaborate plan that takes you home on a level that you can't imagine, that you built for yourself. That's the part that's so cool about it. And the more authentic that you are, the more that you actually get to learn about it in this world while you're still alive instead of transitioning and looking back at it. So it's such a gift to be able to see from the eyes of eternity. And every day that you're more authentic, you get more of that. In the organization, we call it dimensionality, the ability to see the intricacies that, that bring everything together. Because this whole game is designed to bring us together. And it always does. Sometimes we resent it and we miss out on an opportunity. But if we just show up and be like, okay, well, this is happening. What's in it for me? Then everything changes, you know? But yeah, to answer your question in a short way, absolutely, that's my goal. And everything that I do to be authentic. <laughs> Yeah, I resonate with that. It is my goal, but I also know I'm not authentic everywhere. And that's literally our next question. Where do I tend to not show up authentically in my life? And I feel like taking a stab at that first. And Jesus has kind of shared in his own experience, but it is also for me, my singing class and hmm. how I would, and I still know there is room for me to grow in that class. But yes, I know there is something there, which is like, if I had to say that, you know, all the work I could do to be more authentic is stacked up in one place. It's like in my singing class, the, the moment I enter, it's just there. And so that's one place that I'm still working towards showing up fully in like my power, my magnificence, and like really taking everything that gets highlighted. It's hard work for now. Yeah. I'll yeah. share my experiences. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. You, you go. Okay. Um, yeah. So for me, it's interesting. I really love the video game metaphor as life being a, a video game because that helps me. But also, what's been coming to mind when it comes to like where am I being authentic? Where am I not being authentic? Is I keep seeing a game playing out, not a video game, but like a game of tossing and catching ball and tossing it between myself and another person or whatever it is. And there are some people who I'm tossing the conversational ball or the energetic ball between them. We're having a good time just tossing it back and forth and we get each other. We have a nice flow. And then there are some where I'm like, I don't really understand the person all that well. So I'm like, is that a good time to throw you the ball? And, and it ends up landing awkwardly and they got to run and go get it. And then they throw it to me and I'm not expecting it. And then I have to figure that out. And so sometimes I'll, I'll be like, okay, I'm, this isn't a good experience. I'm going to go walk away, sit down for a little bit. And then other times I'll, I'll kind of feel out my environment a little bit better and, and then kind of like make sure I'm catching eyes with them. And so, yeah, that's my metaphor for, there are people that I don't, you know, when it comes to not being as authentic, there are people that, you know, I look at them and I don't have that understanding with them. I don't actually understand the game that they're playing and it's a mystery. There are people that are mysteries to me. That's how I describe it. And with those people, that's when I'm less authentic because I'm still figuring out how to toss the ball to them <laughs> without hurting anybody. So, yeah. So you don't play dodgeball with them is what you're saying? <laughs> Yeah, I would love to. I think, actually, I think you're you're highlighting for me that if I play more sporty games, if I kind of do that kind of thing, or not even sport necessarily, it could be like online hockey of some kind, you know, but just kind of where you have to have that quick eye movement sort of, sort of thing, that probably help me out a bit. You know, there's a new dodgeball game that came out for the Switch, so you might look it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love the Switch for that kind of thing, because it has those handheld devices, but dodgeball, okay, I'll make a note. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, for me, it's in relationships. It, that's the hardest part for me is in relationships. Like whenever I want to be something for someone instead of just being. And it becomes difficult because there's this like part of me that was taught that you're supposed to love a certain way. You're supposed to communicate a certain way. You have to look a certain way. All of these things are, are part of this whole like relationship dynamic. 
And I think that's the hardest part because I, I kind of catch myself in an over giving mode instead of a sharing space or in an over receiving mode instead of a sharing space. And that's something that I've been working on really strongly is like, okay, how do I have an authentic relationship in my life with everyone in my life? Like, how do I have authenticity at all costs in the open relationship with life? And what would that look like? Like, how does that even work? And to be honest with you, I, I don't know yet. Like, I'm still trying to figure that out every day at a time, but definitely in relation with others. Like, mm. if I'm by myself, whatever I'm doing, I can be authenticated 100%, super easy, not a problem. The moment that another dynamic comes into play it's like okay well yeah okay you're being authentic i'm being authentic this is going really good wait something happened that we weren't expecting why did that white bunny appear <laughs> and then you know it just throws off the whole thing because then the person's like hey jason like you should have told me about the white bunny appearing and i'm like i just saw mm -hmm. it and killed me instantly i couldn't talk, I couldn't talk. <laughs> right and so there's like this whole dynamic and a little ptsd from the white bunny incident and ultimately <laughs> but the, the point is you know we do the best we can and the things that we can't be authentic in yet, if we just attempt to be authentic in those things, we're at least 1% closer, if not more. And so, yeah, relationships are definitely the, the place that I find that myself either giving and receiving dynamic instead of sharing. For me, it's in the things I create. So it could be like in any aspect, it could be literally like a painting. It could be me singing, right? That is something, me creating something in the space. It could be the way I create my home, like the way I set something up, like where I put my couch, where I put like the curtains in my house, mm -hmm. like where I'm putting all this stuff, where I even feel it sometimes where I could even have a very close friend or family member come over and a parts of me like, this is how I built my home. And I kind of like uh, looking and sneaking an eye, like, are they staring at that part? Like, did I mess up or something? <laughs> Just the way that I'm creating myself in my world, that, that's where I'm definitely still growing. Huh. All of that, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the next question is, what you holds... Yeah. She started. She answered first, I think. Oh, yeah, she did. I did. Didn't I, I was yeah. saying it was my singing class, but after hearing all of you, I was like, that too, that too, that too. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. 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 Okay. What holds me back from showing up authentically? I think in our previous question, we've kind of addressed this, but if there's more to be added. For me, it's the vulnerability of being seen. Like, and, and it's, it's funny for me because I practiced a lot in, let's put it like observation and seeing what's there, right? And seeing how things show up and looking at the details and looking at subtleties and just expanding my, just being able to see-ness Right. It's like if this exists in front of me, what is actually in front of me? But then to me, it goes even further where it's like, well, now it's me, though. So it's like I'm very good at seeing at the things like parts inside of me and things outside of me. But if I'm like that fullness that is me and being out in the world, it's like, can I uh, look at that at me for myself? So that that's the I would call like, yeah, closer to like the core of what I'm working on. I would say misunderstanding for me. Like uh, the misunderstanding of the role or the space that I'm supposed to be in the situation, because especially in relationships, like the way that every relationship is never going to be the same ever in history. Like you, you might have been prepared to climb a mountain, but each mountain is not the same mountain. The rocks are different. You know, you, you have that, that understanding. And, and so the misunderstanding of or the trying to apply the past to the present kind of idea, which gets in the way of just showing up. Because if you have an idea or an expectation of how to do something, then when you do the thing, you don't have the openness to be authentic in the thing because you're just copying what was instead of being what is. Mm. It brings up like if you have a success, then there is this tendency to al almost replicate it again and you know want to just be successful again versus showing up in the moment and making a new success and having new lessons. I often catch myself doing that also. I mean, I don't know if you do that, but yeah, I catch myself doing that sometimes. And when you shared that, what it's bringing up the fact that one of the things that I do is this thing like, am I too much? I ask myself this question, wherever I show up, if I'm holding myself back, it's often the question, am I too much? Am I, is this level of love too much? Is this level of expression too much? And I just feel like 
is my too muchness going to squash the other person or like not have room for them to be themselves and so I, I literally like try to shrink myself because of that so this is it's still work it's pro like work in progress but also just being afraid of like my own power so I often find myself going into the extreme like shell and really like tiptoeing in the world and then if I'm like showing up then the next moment I'm like have you overdone it you know mm. so yeah I can relate to that, but also I have a lot of differences that at least happen internally for me when it comes to what stops me from being authentic. It's, um, I would say it's more like my self-doubt and my, like what perceptions of myself might be outdated or just negative even. Um, so like for you, you said you have, you, you don't want to be showing up too big. I feel like I often am careful to stay small. So it's similar, but very different where um, you already, like, I would say from what I'm hearing from you, you, well, I don't want to, I feel like I would be overstepping if I were to kind of try to guess on that. But um, for myself, I have, I hold images of myself that feel like, okay, so whatever happens here, I'm small. I'm not, you know, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not that. Um, and then every now and then I'll get some sort of reflection or experience that reminds me, actually, you're amazing. So it's okay to be that way. <laughs> and then continue into the authenticity from that space. So yeah, lots of reminders of that recently, actually. Awesome. I think it was in one of the sessions with Jason that, um, you know, Jason, you helped me see that I don't need to show up for a space or for a game, but just be myself. And like, if I just allow myself to not wear any hat and just show up as myself, mm. I, then I'm just, as if I'm showing up in my own truth, I can sync up to the space was my understanding. Instead of like looking at is where, how, what is the size I should be showing up at in this room or with this set of people mm. or in this situation, like trying to see my own size and this size and overcomplicate things if, if I just show up as me. And then in my presence and my truth, I understand what is really being asked in this space. How do I want to play in this space right now? So that was really helpful. I felt like sharing that. Yeah, just think of it like the bubble or the ocean. You get a choice between how you show up. If you want to show up as the bubble, then there's only so much room for you. But if you show up as the ocean, then everything is part of you. And so you can flow with the space so much perfectly. Mm -hmm. Jesus, did you share already? Yeah, didn't I? Didn't yeah, you did. yeah. <laughs> yes. I thought yeah, you did. did. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. I can oh, move on. What wasn't yours? The no, I was going to say your environment. Uh, what what know. holds you back, Jesus? What did you say? Do you even remember? <laughs> yeah, it was. I was talking about me, so I can see everything, but me being able to see me. And actually me showing up and looking at me showing up. Yeah, you should, you're mm -hmm. right. I believe you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the fifth one is, what differences do I see when I show up authentically? How does my showing up authentically ripple out in my world? That's one question, like or two questions. We did actually answer that at the beginning. Yep. We talked, we started definitely talking about it. Yeah. I'll just reemphasize where for me, it's like, I always end up seeing more choice, not just in myself, but in everything around me, be it the people or the space. It's just, there is more opportunity, which to me also mm -hmm. looks like there's just more suddenly lightness and opportunity for laughter. Like whenever I start to make the authentic move, I suddenly start to see people have the choice to start actually making jokes or seeing like how to poke fun with people and actually play with people instead of just do business with people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like more hope enters the space when I'm authentic. Like I just see people like immediately that the, the chips that were on their shoulders and like the stress that they were feeling just seems to go away. And the space just feels like more hopeful. Like there's room mm -hmm. for a new discovery to happen. That's awesome. Yeah, um, I would say what I feel is the response when I'm being authentic in the world and the ripples are creativity in this space um, and in the people around me. 
I feel like that's one of my wants and hopes for the world too, is, you know, where there is a lack of creativity in the world, where there's a lack of creativity in the business world as well. Um, my dream is, is to bring that creativity into it. So like for education um, in the world, that's one of my biggest hopes is to bring creativity and exploration back into the world. So now that you're, I'm being asked the question, that's what I actually feel is, is um, one of the ripple effects is by being authentic, people feel that ability to be creative in the space, which makes me happy, so. Yeah, it makes perfect sense, actually. Hmm. For me, it's uh, seeing when I'm authentic, I see like the walls melt. And if there was a situation which was not navig navigable, is that a word, navigable? <laughs> it is now. <laughs> If, I'm going to say it. If, if we understand <laughs> we the meaning, it. then it's no, a word. I, <laughs> I suddenly feel like there is now like a place possible and um, hearts open up and walls come down and co-creation is possible when I show up authentically. Mm -hmm. that's yeah. And I also feel like that's, that's a gift I know I have when I am truly, truly authentic. Yeah. I guess we all have, but you know. Yay. <laughs> So those are the five questions. Uh, we're awesome. through. Cool. So if it anybody, felt like it went by really quickly. Yeah, I was just going to say, if anybody in the chat or watching has any questions, I guess we could, if you guys are open, we could answer a couple questions if they come up. Yeah. Cool. While we're waiting for some questions, I have a question for you guys. What's your favorite thing uh -oh. you've done today? Jason, your eyes, you were like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I know what Jason's favorite is, actually. <laughs> it's when he started playing that game. <laughs> I'm designing my character, for sure. Yeah. I've only got to do it for, like, 30 minutes so far, so. Oh, and okay. I'll I, let you speak for yourself. It's kind of cool, though. It, it, yeah, that's definitely one of my favorite things. But it's cool to watch, like, the support of XCM, like, the community mm -hmm. coming together to really help it out and to stabilize it because you know that was something i asked about the community it was like hey you know if you feel open to it support xm a little bit today and then it rallied really strongly and became stable mm -hmm. at, at 0.33 which is you know the master number so it's actually kind of cool for me to see that there's enough people in the world right now that are like hey yeah i want to support this i feel good about this and then i did a whole thing on crypto the other day so the fact that like crypto is living energy and when people support it it's a whole different thing than like supporting fiat or something else. So it's really just about that light and to watch the world actually come together and, and in that space of hope and just innocence and really allow it to come through in that way. And that was probably one of my favorite things today. Other than that, though, definitely designing my character. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody else want to answer that question? Because, well, there's already questions in the chat if we want to move on to those. Oh, Rithika, go ahead. So for me, it was what I mentioned earlier, like bawling my eyes out and watching myself ball and being like laughing and crying and feeling <laughs> like anger and joy, like anger moving out and joy coming in and like resentment moving out and personality like going out. It was an incredible experience, like watching this movie of myself go through that and then just like gratitude come in. That I, I can't believe that healing can look so funny and weird and <laughs> awesome at the same time. Yeah. So. Awesome. I'll okay. answer and then you get to the uh, question. Me, <laughs> 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 um, Mine was, I would have thought it would be getting to walk with the puppies on, on, in nature, but actually it's when I got on the copper table and instead of doing what I normally do, which is watch something like on YouTube while I'm on the copper table, which is like this awesome healing machine um, or so healing supportive machine, um, I just chose to go inward and meditate. And I was really, really blown away by how much better I felt from doing that. I didn't realize how much I was probably getting in my own way <laughs> by kind of always having something to focus on outside of myself. But I let go and I just went inward and I felt amazing afterwards. So that was my highlight. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. I like how you almost said that <laughs> you were like, I felt amazing afterwards. I felt amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, we have some questions. The first one is Priam. 
Could you suggest some practices to help with being authentic, letting go of the dear of the fear of being judged or rejected by others? Hmm. That feels like a, coming up with your own practice feels like it'd be the most supportive in this case. Like whatever helps you make room to me feels like it'd be most important, right? Because when there's room, there's more opportunity for you to show up in that space. I can share what helps me. <laughs> for me, it's like um, what's help. What helps me to value myself in that in that single moment? So if I fear feel a fear of of judgment from others. Um, it's because I'm overly focused on them and their response and their reaction. Um, speaking of which, I had like awesome healing session on this. So it makes sense. I have more insight on it. But um, yeah, and part of my method might even be just to connect with my body a little bit more and just kind of like calm my body down, soothe, maybe connect to my heart in particular. So that helps me. Well, it's similar, but the other side of what you're sharing, Jen, is when I'm feeling judged or judging it's usually like for me it's like going inward and if I'm judging someone or if I'm like hate feeling even like these feelings of resentment towards somebody I just ask myself like what's in it for me to look at and where can I take responsibility often when I ask that question like what can I heal where can I take responsibility I'm shown why that experience is showing up in my life and I'm able to then in my own time you know as I choose I'm able to integrate that and things outside start to shift when I do that within me, I've noticed. Oh, makes sense. Okay, so. That's the next, English. Question. <laughs> All right. next question from Rachel. How can one practice being the ocean and not a bubble? That's a very difficult thing in the mind and a very easy thing in reality. So if you allow yourself to show up fully, you'll know when you become the bubble because you'll shrink in the moment and everything will become less valuable. When you're the ocean, everything, all the colors, the space, the taste of things, like the smell of things, like everything is enhanced. It's this amazing sensation. The color green is majestic. And when you're the bubble, the color green is green. And so if you look at the color green and go, oh, it's green, then you're the bubble. Yeah, that's my mm -hmm. best advice when it comes to the wow. difference between the ocean and the bubble is become friends with the color green and know when it's not being authentic. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Like being able to see the beauty outside of you means the beauty inside of you is definitely starting to shine. That makes me think of wonder being a key, key ingredient. And Rachel, you know a lot about that word. <laughs> I think you have activations you've written with that word. <laughs> cool. And then we have another question from Rachel again. Rachel gets two tickets in the hat. So <laughs> there are a lot of thoughts that can come into the human brain. I often get caught up in which ones to express. How can I get more clear about which ones I want to express? It's a good question. I am not really good at answering this question. Yeah, I don't feel I have anything. All right, I, I, I can. Oh. I I just express, and and so there's that, which makes it a little bit more difficult. But if I were to just take a stab at this question, what I would say: <laughs> learn by living. <laughs> use the wrong ones, then mm -hmm. acknowledge that you use the wrong ones, and course correct and learn from that, because. The best way is to get out the things that need to get out and to find what is real through that. Because people make mistakes all the time. They say the wrong thing. That, that's not a big deal as long as they're able to take ownership of that and learn from that and grow. That just gets the wrong thing out uh, early on. So then you have an easier way of it in the future, right? So it's kind of like if you play cards, you're going to get a bad hand from time to time, but you can still win with a bad hand. So using the things and then being honest with those things gives you a good hand if you have all kinds of thoughts in your head. And again, I don't have thoughts, so this is kind of a difficult thing, but I would assume it's like having playing cards, right? You just have lots of them. And then when you get rid of them, you don't get them back. Hmm. It's not go yeah. fish, right? It's like a different card game. Yeah, to, to me, it's like, 
you you got like a lot of candy at Halloween and you look in your bag and there's like a ton of candy, but only one or two of those things is actually your favorite candy, like your divinity candy. And then you get to learn like, okay, I actually don't like this piece. I actually, this piece is awesome. And to like, it might be that you start to learn the flavor of conciseness and clarity that authenticity for you actually is. But like Jason's saying, it's like, mm. yeah, you just got to do some of it to be like, actually, I just realized this baby Ruth sucks. I only liked <laughs> And that will just take some getting used to. And then you end up pe eating pizza every day for a week and probably the next week and the next week. And you still enjoy it and you have a great time and you want to keep doing it. Exactly. And that's perfect. There are definitely worse things in life. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And right, you're healthy. Nice. Exactly. <laughs> for a diet every day is the secret to life, right? That's what, mm -hmm. they, what they say. I see one more question coming up. So Jude asks, any suggestions on how to genuinely feel capable of letting go anything, if required, not attached, and not shutting down, cutting off from X, Y, Z, yet whilst the thing is still in your life, as it's still okay for it to be in your life for now? Oh, that's a great question. For me, it's acceptance. If I'm not in acceptance of something and I'm doing something because of something, I find that that it, it creates a resistance and then a resistance mm -hmm. inside of that resistance. And so it's like this bubble of like resistance that then when I try to get into the bubble of resistance to process it, it's just like pure resentment. And I'm like, no, I uh, don't know. No. And, and so in, in that way, I feel like if I accept the thing, then the bubble of resistance dissolves and so does the resentment within it. And then it doesn't matter if the thing is in my world or not, as long as I don't have to play with it. And if I have to play with it, then I get to work on that level of acceptance of, okay, why am I having to play with this? What in me feels obligated to play with this? And I continue to go through that whole process until all that's left is, do I want to play with this? Is this authentic for me to do? And if the answer is no, then usually I won't play with the thing. Yeah, you, I believe you said a very key word in there, which is obligated, like being able to notice the areas where obligation instead of love or understanding are in the space. Like if, if you even just like Jason was saying, if you even just consider the situation without you actually being in it, and the first thing you feel is like the contraction or tightness or the sense of like dread or tiredness already, right? Then yeah, start to look at those pieces inside mm -hmm. of you that feel like that obligation or the piece that is like, I'm just stuck in this pattern. And in which ways can you start to at least make some room where a different choice or just a sun, another branch of reality can start to exist. And from there, you can actually start to make some wiggle room. And that's all you need. It's just a little bit of wiggle room. And then you'll start to notice your own love can start to show up. That's all you need. It's just a little bit of wiggle room. I feel like adding one thing, which has been supportive for me, is just this reminder and a practice of this is for me, and I'm just not seeing it yet. So that helps me come into acceptance. And because I have reminded and seen from my life experience enough times that yes, life is for me. I truly, truly believe that. It helps me in a, in a really difficult situation when I am either wanting to project or like contract um, and like holding on tight. That reminder to myself helps me ease into acceptance with more grace. Yeah. What's happening with me as you guys are sharing all of your examples is I keep imagining that the ball tossing example or the metaphor, and I'm I'm seeing it play out through that. Whereas, like, let's say I'm I've been for a while tossing the ball back and forth between myself and another person, um, and then at some point I'm like, wait, do I want to be doing? Do I want to be tossing this ball between me and so and so? And then I can maybe slow down and then realize. Like, wait, why am I, why am I playing this ball game? Do, and then you start to stop and you ask yourself these questions like, well, there are other games I can play. Do I, you know, do I want to play a game with that person? And then, so yeah, there's all these questions you can just start to go inward and more inward on as, as what you want to play with and experiment with. And maybe it's time to change it up. Maybe you do want to play with that person, but not that game anymore. True. Yeah, a lot of times just doing something to change the dynamic helps a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pattern interrupt. Exactly. Yeah. 
Well, I don't see any more questions in the chat, so I guess this is this is where we're at now. Cool. What's happening with it? <laughs> What's going on? Having a great time. <laughs> I can accept Rithika doing that, yes. <laughs> I don't know if I want to touch with all the Rithika anymore. <laughs> Me acknowledging how awesome this has been. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. Thank you everybody who watched and asked questions and just said hello or just watched and didn't even... All the lurkers, like, thank you guys so much. And... <laughs> here this is these slides are a lot of fun exactly yeah that's what matters mm -hmm. cool then i guess that's it do i just end it awesome. okay. thank you guys thank you you everyone. guys are awesome bye, bye. bye. bye.